Hello, Professor Diamond. It's my great pleasure to have you through a video conference. And uh, as you may know, Professor Diamond, you are very popular in Seoul, in Korea, because uh, many Korean readers have read your books, this, you know, guns, jumps, and um, steers. Also, this book is a b i b l e So probably I can safely say that uh, you are the very steady seller and um, you know bestseller in Korea. So what about your impression? Many Koreans are a fan of you. I am a fan of Korea. So uh, I'm Jared Diamond. I'm a geographer. I teach at the University of California here in Los Angeles. Thank you for involving me. We are our pleasure. So I'd like to um, talk about uh, the current global you know, pandemic, COVID-19. It is triggering dramatic changes in a wide area in a, a split second. What do you think about this? I mean, how would you describe the impact of COVID-19 on humanity from the perspective of your crisis theory and transition? There are two things new about COVID. One is that COVID is a pandemic. It's a disease around the whole world. Until recently, it was not possible to have worldwide diseases because there was not rapid communication. When the Black Death plague hit China and then Europe, Plague could not spread to Australia nor the Americans because there was not rapid transportation. The first pandemic, the first disease that spread around the world was the influenza at the end of World War I, made possible by fast steamships. Now, this ordinary disease, COVID, is spreading around the world, not by fast steamships, but by jet planes. And so that's something new. The other thing that's new about COVID, besides the rapid spread, besides it's being a pandemic, is that COVID is a disease to which nobody has immunity. The diseases of the past, like smallpox, when Europeans brought smallpox to the new world, Europeans had experience of smallpox. They had protection, they had immunity, genetic immunity, antibodies, whereas Native Americans had none. But in the case of COVID, COVID is a new disease. Nobody has immunity to COVID. Every people in the world is susceptible to COVID. That's something new. What I would like also to emphasize for the purposes of our conference, where each country is evaluating countermeasures against COVID, this is new. The world is carrying out experiments. Different countries are adopting different countermeasures. Some countries are adopting a lockdown, closing down as tightly as possible. Some countries are not adopting a lockdown. Sweden, for example, decided not to have a lockdown, but decided to see whether it could build up herd immunity by letting everybody, especially young people, get infected. Within my own country, within the United States, there are experiments. My own state of California, the governor of my state, acted quickly and adopted the first lockdown in the United States. But other states in the United States, such as Georgia and Mississippi, have acted much more passively. So the world is carrying out a gigantic experiment, how best to respond to this disease. And we don't yet know the outcome of the experiment. It appears that the Swedish attempt to avoid lockdown is not working out as well as was hoped in Sweden. Other countries like Vietnam that adopted quickly a severe lockdown seem to be doing well, but in short, this familiar disease, this apparently mild disease, is now a new phenomenon, a global disease, thanks to jet airplanes, and the world, the cities of the world, are experimenting with how best to solve it, and we don't yet know the outcome of this experiment. 
Great. Um, you made description you know, how uh, different countries are you know, um, dealing with this uh, global pandemic differently, in different way. Is the, you know, the, the reaction or response uh, against uh, this COVID-19 is maybe different. And uh, Seoul and Korea's response are very much renowned to uh, other countries in the name of K-quarantine. So I can explain the uh, you know, characteristics of our uh, response to COVID-19. Uh, you know, based on the lesson we learned from the MERS five years ago uh, in 2015, when the first COVID-19 case was confirmed, Seoul City uh, immediately dispatched a rapid response team and also, you know, um, tested many people as quickly as possible. So then Seoul has been tasking bold actions by tracking whereabouts of the confirmed cases and, you know, isolating those who came into contact with them and disclosing every information to the public. So that way, the citizens themselves can take precaution to prevent these infections. So Seoul also took innovative actions, methods, like drive-through or walk-through, screening centers, and anonymous tests, and so on. So you pointed out that the elements defining the development of human civilization are strong social institutions and technology and op optimal fragmentation principle. So Seoul's anti-epidemic can, efforts can also be explained by these three elements as well. Seoul and Korea has the, you know, learning on national healthcare insure system programs that covers all the citizens. And also we have public hospitals all over the country and own the virus test kits of the world-class accuracy. So, and second, we used various cutting-edge technologies also in the process of responding to COVID-19. You know, when tracking the movements of the confirmed cases, uh, we analyzed the information like credit uh, transactions, credit, credit card transactions, and mobile phone records, and CCTV footages. Third, Seoul also experienced, you know, alongside um, strong collective intelligence where citizens are willing to, um, you know, voice their opinions, discuss, and reach a consensus. This was clearly demonstrated in the candlelight revolution, you know, two years ago. And also, so I can safely say that the victory against the you know, pandemic was the wholly, uh, you know, attributed, should be attributed to the citizens. And um, so our citizens actively took the lead in the virus containment and voluntarily following the guidelines of sanitation. So, you know, how do you evaluate mm -hmm. this, the uh, different effort and measures taken by the each different countries. To me, as an American, this is fascinating, the differences between countries and the difference that you describe between Korea's response and the American response. Another difference between Korea and the United States um, is that my sense is that um, Koreans are more willing to, to cooperate and to accept direction from their government. The United States is at the opposite extreme. The United States, along with Australia, is the most individ individualistic country in the world. Americans are disposed not to accept the advice from their government. And so, for example, here in California, in my state of California, until recently we had a lockdown. A few days ago, 
Um, our governor relaxed the lockdown, but there are many people here in my city of Los Angeles um, who are not following the direction of wearing masks. And we are paying the price for that. The largest number of deaths in the world is now in the United States. In short, it seems to me that the, the world in general, and we Americans in particular, have a lot to learn from Korea and from your own capital city in how to respond quickly, in the advantages of an excellent health care system, in your free hospitals, and in your willingness to accept the direction from good ideas on the part of your leaders. Thank you very much for your good comment. I would like to move next, uh, you know, about the post-corona uh, civilizations. So actually, you know, in fact, not just Seoul, but Korea uh, ha as a whole has not received a favorable evaluation uh, regarding climate change. So with the inauguration uh, of my mayorship in you know, uh, 2011. Uh, so I decided to turn this trend. So, uh, you know, I can uh, point out that we, I brought a package of climate change programs. The first is the one least nuclear, uh, you know, power, power plant. So um, I invited the citizens to involve, to participate in this project. So, you know, uh, by producing the um, renewable energy and saving the energy at the same time, so we were very much successful in attaining the goal of, uh, you know, um, amount of three uh, nuclear power plants uh, energies. So as um, in also the second project is the solar city. I mean, you know, um, our aim was establishing uh, one million photovoltaic panels uh, in, you know, one million households of Seoul citizens. So, um, and also the third is the Seoul Declaration, Seoul's promise to handle the climate change with companies and our citizens. So, um, you know, by 2030, we aim to reduce greenhouse gas emissions by 40% uh, compared to 2005. Uh, we also will carry out a Green New Deal in earnest, turning Seoul more green. We will turn our urban infrastructure green uh, by making a large financial investment uh, in buildings, transportation, and waste management to become a zero-carbon city by 2050. Um, so we are truly ready to transform ourselves from environmental building to a green hero. So how do you expect the post-corona uh, transportation of civilization in South, in Korea, and in, in the world together. Environmental problems have the potential of killing far more people than COVID and of causing more permanent damage. Just as an example, because we're talking about uh, diseases, COVID as a disease, climate change also is having effects on the spread of diseases through the world. Yes, there are new emerging diseases of which COVID is one, but there are old diseases which are spreading through the world to areas where they were not before as a result of climate change. In particular, tropical diseases, diseases that used to be confined to the tropics. With global warming, those diseases are now spreading into cooler climates, which means that some tropical diseases have already reached the United States. And the expectation is that they will also reach Korea. For example, diseases such as malaria and dengue fever that we think of as tropical diseases are spreading. An African disease called chukungunya fever, which used to be confined to Uganda about 10 years ago, the first case of chukungunya fever 
appeared in Italy, of all places. That's a result of climate change. In short, I compliment you on taking the lead in dealing with this world problem of climate change, which frankly is a much more serious problem in the long run than is COVID. So actually you mentioned in Guns, Dumbs and Steel that the geographical and the ecological characteristics can determine you know, the um, you know, many aspects of people's lives. Then when global warming persists, what do you think will happen with the germs? I mean, do you think um, you know, the germs or epidemics are likely to spread further? If so, and we, if we have to live with such virus together, what we can do? In answer to your first question, yes, there are going to be more germs and more epidemics. And in answer to your second question, what can we do? We can be prepared. As for the spread of more germs, the ger new germs um, arise in a number of ways. New diseases of humans arise, especially from diseases of animals. If you think of the famous new diseases of humans in the last 40 or 50 years, they are AIDS, which arose from Africa, from our closest relatives, primates. They are mad cow disease that arose from a disease of cattle. Uh, they are SARS, which arose in wild animal markets in China. They are MERS, which arose through contact with camels. They are flu, and now they are COVID. So new diseases of humans arise from contact with animals, but there's contact with wild animals in the world, especially in wild animal markets, and through the traditional medicine trade, and through the bushmeat trade. So we have to expect more new diseases. COVID will not be the last new disease. And in addition, as I explained, we have to expect the spread of old diseases to new places where those diseases were not. Your second question about what can we do, a short answer about what we can do is be prepared. The world, by and large, was not prepared for COVID. A few countries were but most of the world was not prepared. What the world needs to do, expecting that there will be new diseases, is to anticipate our response so that when a new disease arrives, we will be ready. In Korea, you were ready. You were ready with tracing. You were ready with your medical systems. Other countries were not ready. Vietnam was ready because Vietnam had a bad experience in 2002 from the spread of SARS in China. So Vietnam, like you, rapidly adopted tracing. And so Vietnam, like Korea, has had relatively few COVID cases, but most of the world has not been prepared. In short, what we, your question about what we should do, we should think in advance about what problems may arise, not only problems of disease, but problems of electrical breakdown, problems of financial breakdown. Think out in advance how we would respond, have a plan, stockpile the devices, and be prepared. Mm -hmm. Right. And, uh, you know, you also described the impact of germs on people in your book. For example, uh, those who lived with domesticated animals were able to grow antibodies. Uh, that are resistant to the uh, animal-borne virtues that are resistant. And on the other hand, those who failed to do so ended up losing their lives due to, due to the infection. In case of uh, COVID-19, some argue that the virus originated uh, from the wet market where wild animals were traded. So do you think this kind of trade should it be prohibited in one of the way of preventive way for the, you know, COVID-19 or other disease? Of course, yes. The major ways, the three principal ways that new diseases have emerged from wild animals in the last 50 years have been the wild animal markets, not only in China, but there were other countries with wild animal markets. 
Secondly, by what's called bushmeat trade, that's hunting of animals for food, especially in Africa. And third, the trade in animals for traditional medicines. People are accustomed to traditional medicines. People are accustomed to wild animal markets. Uh, but they produce devastating consequences. So again, in answer to your question, what should we do to reduce the risk of new emerging diseases in the future? They are to close down the animal markets, to stop the bushmeat trade, to reduce the trade in traditional medicines, but also more fundamentally to deal with climate change so that there will not be the spread of tropical diseases. Right. Um, you know, the, I agree with your analysis and response. So I would like to turn the, our topics to the um, inequality issues. I agree that social inequalities are getting worse. In particular, the infectious disease is disconnecting people's uh, you know, you know, relationship and therefore causing a serious economic crisis. I think this goes the same for the US, but also in Korea and so. A lot of people closed their business and lost jobs. So even from the beginning of this pandemic, uh, Seoul's main focus was to protect our citizens' lives and ensure their stable living. For this, we provided emergency allowance more quickly than any other city and offered various financial aids for small businesses, uh, owners, and irregular workers. Now, we are uh, pushing to introduce a universal employment insurance that covers all the working people. So I think we need to secure a tight safety net for the sake of human security in a society where unstable employment still remains. And there is high chance for the economic to shut down due to infectious disease at any time. So what is your uh, reply and the response to this to prevent more serious inequality in times of global you know, and pandemics? My response um, is, in effect, to double what you said. By that, I mean that inequality is important at two levels. Inequality is important within a country, and inequality is important between countries. Talking about inequality within a country, um, in the United States, we have much experience now that although nobody started out with antibodies to COVID, nevertheless, some Americans are dying at higher rates than are other Americans. The highest mortality rates in the United States are among Native Americans and among African Americans, and they're lower among European Americans. Why? It's because of existing health problems. People, poorer people who are in poorer health are more likely to die from COVID than other people. And that has consequences. Here in my city of Los Angeles, which is a city with great inequality, there are very wealthy people in Los Angeles and there are very poor people in Los Angeles. There's a saying, a bitter saying within the United States, when will rich Americans start to become concerned about the problems of poor Americans? And the, the bitter answer to that is, rich Americans will be concerned about the problems of poor Americans when rich Americans themselves feel endangered. That is happening now. The other side to inequality is inequality around the world, poorer countries and richer countries, and we can talk more about that. But let me stop now mentioning those two features of inequality. Mm -hmm. Right. The inequality issue is not only confined to one country, one city. And now uh, I would like to, uh, you know, move our topics to the, uh, you know, next coming, uh, you know, the uh, digital society. Uh, Seoul is preparing for a new normal in the long run. COVID-19 is changing society more rapidly than ever. Now that we have advanced digital and smart technologies in place, a change to a non 
contact society can take place even faster. We are holding this summit virtually, you know, like this. So uh, in a society, you know, where changes are being made rapidly, so I think building a new standard is very much important. So uh, what are you expecting, you know, um, the next coming society and civilization in terms of such a, you know, digital and untacked society? There are things that I'm expecting and that have already arrived for us, just as for you. You mentioned virtual connections um, in the United States now, virtual connections. My university closed down in March. It closed down just after my last lecture and just before my final exam. So that my final exam was given not in person, but over the internet. So much of the economy and so much of the operation of our society has turned to online. And this is the case for you and it's the case for us and the case for the world. But the biggest change for the world, I think, um, is that the world, for the first time in world history now, faces a global problem that is recognized as a global problem. Never before has the world recognized that we face a global problem. Yes, there are really global problems, such as climate change that you've talked about, but the world has not rallied together and recognized climate change as a common enemy. Why? Because climate change kills people slowly, doesn't kill people quickly. And when someone dies of respiratory diseases or dies of ag from decreased agricultural production, it's not easy to say that was due to climate change. In the case of COVID, when someone is infected with COVID, they may die within a few days. There's no doubt that they have died of COVID. So COVID is now recognized as a global threat for the first time in world history. Thank you very much. Citizens uh, around Professor? the world are recognizing the global threat. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. So I want to move our topic on the uh, new normal issues. And so I think the world already stepped into the uh, you know, post-coronavirus society once the outbreak of coronavirus took place. So um, in such a post-coronavirus world, how should cities change? In particular, uh, how should metropolis like so make a transition in order to better respond to epidemics? There are a dozen factors that are familiar to any of us who've experienced a personal crisis. In dealing with a personal crisis, it's important to acknowledge, to take responsibility. But one important feature in dealing with a crisis, whether it's personal or national crisis, is the importance of models. That's to say, to model your response on another country or city or person that has faced a similar crisis and dealt well with it, and avoid taking as a model a country or a person that has failed to respond well to a crisis. In that respect, um, so although it's a city of Korea, although it's a country of 40, 50 million people, um, it's not a large fraction of the world's population, but Korea has potentially an enormous importance for the whole world as a model. Other countries can look at what Korea has done, what Seoul has done, and can learn how you dealt, have been dealing successfully with your crisis, whereas other countries, many other countries, have been dealing unsuccessfully. So there's the opportunity for the world to learn from Seoul and Korea. I think we should learn each other, you know, all the time. Um, my next question is about the world order uh, in the post-coronavirus, you know, era. So I understand that when you wrote the book, Gun, Jumps and Steel, you wanted to know how different parts of the world hold different level of power and wealth. So in such uneven development derived from environmental differences, which ultimately led to inequalities in wealth and power. So 
infectious disease in our modern society, like coronavirus, will, I believe, may bring great changes in civilizations, more so in the global power and wealth climate. So at this moment, uh, you know, the U.S. and China are in fierce competition to seize the hegemony. So in many countries also come into conflict with their neighboring nations. So how do you think the global order will change in these situations? What about the order in Northeast Asia? So just as the Spanish conquerors shifted the focus on civilizations with the spread of germs or epidemics, how would COVID-19 change our future civilizations and powers? Here is how I think that COVID will change our future civilizations and power. And here is how I hope that COVID will change the world. There's much discussion of competition between China and the United States and Europe. There's discussion of whether the result of COVID will be a shift in power around the world. But I think and I hope that the biggest consequence of COVID will be to end discussion about competition between different parts of the world for power and to create discussion that the whole world will, as we say, sink or swim together. One of the, perhaps one of the most important messages of COVID is that no country in the world will be safe from COVID as long as any country in the world continues to have COVID. I would like to be optimistic. I would like to say that my hope for COVID is that we'll teach the world that global problems such as COVID and climate change require global solutions, and that perhaps COVID will have taught the world reluctantly, finally, to stop thinking of competition between different parts of the world and to recognize that we all have to work together to solve world problems, because if we don't work together, we will all fail together. So I totally agree with your analysis that the whole world is really interconnected. So, you know, uh, since COVID-19, some countries uh, closed their borders and also now keeping a great distance from others. However, I think, you know, the cutting of the relations and isolating from each other in the current situation is not the option for us, especially when the world is connected more than ever by one network. So rather, I think we need to come together in solidarity and cooperation. I want to try this together with the world, not leaving any city or any country behind. We are hosting this very summit for the same reasons. So I you know, already suggested to establish an inter-city network under the tentative name called CAP. C-A-A-P, Cities Alliance Against Pandemic, in a spirit of global cooperation and solidarity for anti-epidemic efforts. So, so we continue to take actions to address you know, global epidemic um, with other cities and countries. I would like to share such method with the world. I want to try you know, this together with the world, not leaving any city or country behind. So, you know, we are hosting this very summit for the same reasons. And um, so, how do you think, uh, how we should make efforts, you know, to overcome this COVID-19 crisis, you know, without such uh, hatred or stopping the you know, mutual relations and so on. We have no choice. There is no alternative. Um, if we, if any country tries to protect itself by borders, for a short time that might work, but for a long time it won't work because in this globalized world, people move around too easily and too quickly. Um, if any one or two countries, if Mongolia or Bolivia or Afghanistan or any country 
remains a part of COVID. The whole world is in danger. And that's why I say we have no choice except to cooperate together, to cooperate. Because if we don't cooperate, all of us will be ruined by COVID. And all of us will be ruined by climate change. The world now is in the same boat. We will, as one says, sink or swim together. I'm very happy to hear that. So we have no option, you know, to cooperate each other. Um, and um, actually, you know, I understand that you usually show deep interest in Korean culture and our potentials. And you are also highly praised our writing system, Hangul. So as you may know, Korea has experienced several crises and changes over time. Colonizations, uh, division of the country, and the Korean War, and dictatorship, and industrialization, democratization. So, you know, uh, I would like to ask you, uh, you would like to include this Korean case in your next book, or you know, in uh, adding the Korean chapter in your book? I'm not going to wait for my next book. Um, I, I already um, frequently talk about um, um, Korea. Um, ever since I discovered Hangul and your wonderful writing system, um, I've talked about Korea. I talk to my university students each year about your wonderful writing system. I've taken pleasure in visiting your country ever since about 1997. I visited five times. I, I enjoy the Korean people. Um, my only reg regret for us today is that you and I are not able to meet in person and shake hands in person, that we have to talk virtually. But I look forward to returning to your wonderful country, which is a, a model, again, to use that word model, a model to the world for how a country can rapidly prosper, take advantage of its history, um, achieve a high economic um, performance in a short time, and serve as a model to the world for how to deal with COVID, and serve as a model to the world in so many other respects. I love your country. I shall return whenever invited. Thank you very much. And if you have any intention to write uh, about the uh, you know, Korean Peninsula in your next book, uh, I'd like to invite you uh, providing a good lunch or you know, um, very delicious Korean f traditional food and so on. <laughs> All right? That is a very appetizing invitation. Great, thank you. Um, actually, you know, reading this book, um, I found that you dealt with the Japanese case, uh, including the Meiji period and modern Japan. So I think Korean, you know, peninsula, Korean case is also deserved to be dealt with by you, you know, twice in the next book. Okay? Okay. Thank you very much. And um, uh, I'd like to move to the questions uh, raised by the audience. So um, I selected three of them. So I will make questions to you, uh, you know, representing the audience. The first question is, uh, you know, the, in a time when we have to coexist with the virus, there is no question that cities that are densely populated will have to change how they are. Uh, close packed work environments and large scale, you know, multi-purpose facilities were a good way of making profits thanks to their efficiency and productivity, especially in a city where high rental fees were very common. So, but however, this has instead become the greatest risk factor for cities. 
So how do you see the future of global megacities? This is the first question. Your first question about dense cities. Yes, obviously, the danger of infection is greater in a dense city than in a rural area. Within my own country, the United States, well, the American state other than California that I know best is Montana, where my wife and I spend our vacations. Montana has the lowest population density in the United States. And not surprisingly, there's not much problem of COVID in Montana because people don't meet each other often. There's an acute problem of COVID in New York City, our bigger city, but also here in Los Angeles. What can one do about it? In Los Angeles, we have a lockdown, but we are also doing work virtually. My university has not closed down. We're continuing to teach. We're having to discover new ways of teaching. They're not the ways that we would have chosen, but we are learning to adapt. So mega cities are not going to disappear. We have a big investment in them. We have to learn. We are learning how to operate mega cities um, in a different way now that we cannot meet each other face to face. And then with vaccines, this is going to change already next year. Mm -hmm. You know, um, many experts are expecting that, you know, 60% uh, of whole population in the world will live in urban cities until, you know, um, 10 or 20 years later. So um, do you think this trend, tendency and expectation will be changing? I mean... You know, there may be some dispersion of urban population into, you know, rural area and so on. I don't think that this trend will change. Uh, there are big reasons behind the change. The reasons include that there are, uh, there are advantages to being in cities. It is wonderful to be in Los Angeles. It is wonderful to be in Seoul, Tokyo, Berlin. I choose to live in a big city. That's one reason. Another reason is that agriculture is getting increasingly so productive that one can produce a lot of food on small amounts of land. So the trend towards larger cities is not going to change. The only thing that will change is learning how to reconcile densely populated cities with the risk of diseases. And we are learning it now, and you are serving as a model to us of how to live in a densely populated city and coexist with a new disease. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. And this next question is, um, a return of localization can be interpret interpreted differently as dispersion of concentrated resources. What do you think should be the strategy that global mega cities like New York, Paris, and Seoul should adopt during such a time of major social change? It's a very similar question. So do you think there is so, time for global megacities to give up on the benefits of resource concentrations? Some resources are concentrated whether we like it or not. Um, examples are fisheries. Fish are not uniformly distributed around the world, particularly valuable fish like tuna go in schools. Those are concentrated global resources. The world is learning how to manage global resources. In the past, each country had its own resources. Each country had its own fisheries and managed its own fisheries. But now, Korea and Japan are imp importing a lot of their seafood. That means that if the fisheries of the world are get depleted, then Korea and Japan and the European Union suffer. So a issue for the world today is to manage global resources, not just local resources, but also global resources. And that applies particularly to fisheries, secondly, to forests, thirdly, to topsoil, and fourthly, to water. Those are perhaps the four most important world resources that have to be managed globally. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, actually, you know, this COVID-19 and this pandemic is providing a great stress to the citizens because they were isolated for a long time as a result of, 
you know, social distancing. So um, we are trying to provide more, you know, um, opportunities for them uh, uh, to get cured um, in many ways. So do you have any, you know, advice or, or the, um, you know, the words of consolation with those who are suffering from this stress? You know, not only for Korean, but also many worldwide, you know, um, the audiences. It's a big issue and one that's very real for me. It's real for me partly because my wife, Marie, is a clinical psychologist. She helps people dealing with stress. And now Marie is, has many of her clients who are under stress. But Marie, as a psychologist, can no longer see her clients face to face. She has learned to, quote, see her clients using her cell phone, using media such as FaceTime, that's to say, finding alternatives. For me, I have many dear friends with whom, under normal conditions, I meet for lunch once a week or I meet, meet for a breakfast once a month. That is no longer possible. I've had to find substitutes. My substitutes include talking with friends over Zoom. I would rather be with them in person but I would much rather talk with them over Zoom than not talk with them at all. And another way that I've done it is that one good friend of mine, I meet out of doors. We no longer meet inside the house, but we meet out of doors and we walk up the street two meters from each other. So yes, there is stress from social isolation, but we have to think of ways to get around this stress and there are ways. They're not ways that we would have chosen. Yes, it would be much nicer to sit next to someone and hug someone. But as long as that's not possible, we can still meet with people online and we can meet with people out of doors. And that's what I'm doing. Okay, thank you. And um, so, you know, so our metropolitan government is trying to make the city of Seoul a uh, city of humanities. I mean, you know, uh, we are investing some uh, resources to cultivate the soil on which the more, you know, uh, intellectuals in humanities w would grow uh, and mature. So how you can make advice to us to make our societies uh, or so city to be more you know, um, such a humanistic uh, city. One piece of advice, one way to think of it, um, is to think of living your life in a way such that your children and grandchildren will enjoy a good life. A friend of mine is the head of, at my university, a sustainability program. My University of California has a sustainability program of which my friend happens to be the head. And I recall an occasion when I was walking with my friend on the street, we encountered a neighbor who had never heard about sustainability programs. And he asked my friend, so what is a sustainability program? And her answer was, a sustainability program means creating a world in which your children and grandchildren will also have a good world not just a good world for you alone, but also a good world for you and your grandchildren. And that means many things. I can understand when you say, coming from a poor rural area, my, my grandfather um, immigrated from Eastern Europe in 1902. He was very poor. My father grew up in a poor part of New York City, had to learn about education himself. My parents then taught the value of education to my sister and me. And now my children are 33 years old. I have twin sons. My wife and I are trying to create a good world for my children. The reason that I began to write books, the reason why I have books is that when my twin sons were born, I realized that the future of the world depends upon history and geography. And so I began writing books for a wide public in order to help create a world that is good for the world and my sons. And that's why you have my books, Guns, Germany, Steel, and Upheaval, and Collapse, in the hopes of creating 
a world that will be a good world for my sons and their generation. Thank you very much for your heartfelt response. Um, and so, you know, um, the conversation with you uh, gave great guidance to uh, me and our citizens, and also probably to you know, many audience in other countries, in other cities. Um, and in particular, our conversation also gives a lot of implications and inspirations to Korean society and Seoul at our new turning point. So as you recently said in an interview, the whole world is on the same boat with COVID-19. So now we have to live with virus. So I think that in this society, the role of great global scholars like you is more important than ever in the future. So please continue to give us a lot of guidance and advice. So finally, do you have anything you want to say to people around the world? And do you have any plans to come to Korea and to learn hunger and study more about Korea? Yes, what I would say to people all around the world is that if you have not yet visited Korea, take the opportunity to visit Korea as soon as it is possible to do so because it is a wonderful country. And as far as learning Hangul is concerned, each time that I teach world geography to my students at UCLA, I write up on the board Hangul letters, but in my class, I have Korean students, and my Korean students come to the board and correct my not quite exact writing of Hangul letters. <laughs> I look forward to returning to Korea with great pleasure. Thank you very much. Um, you must be our ambassador. You know, <laughs> thank you very much. And you spent so much time, you know, explaining sincerely to our citizens and the audience of all over the world. Thank you very much. I really want to have you again, you know, through the uh, video conference or, you know, in Seoul. Thank you very much. See you again. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me.